Okay, I think we'll declare it uh, four o'clock and begin uh, the lecture, my last lecture, uh, that's entitled Hayek and Friedman Head to Head. And uh, I want to make a, a few points before I start looking at slides uh, today. Uh, and that is that uh, many Austrians have a love-hate relationship with Milton Friedman. And uh, so I want to start by telling you about the love part, okay? Because I'm, I'm one of those Austrian economists who have a love-hate relationship with Milton Friedman. And uh, what we can notice about him is he's just an extremely good neoclassical microeconomist. And uh, he can put his skills to good use there and has and for decades uh, before others had. Uh, give you several examples. Uh, the issue of rent control, which uh, today sounds like, well, everybody knows about that and they know why it's a bad thing. But in the 1940s, they didn't. And Milton Friedman wrote a paper uh, against price ceilings for rental apartments in New York. And he was taken to task for it virtually by the whole profession. So he was sort of standing alone on that issue, but he persevered with it and others. He wrote an article called Roofs or Ceilings, or Ceilings, meaning that you could have a roof over your head or <laughs> you could be subject to rent ceilings, in which case you wouldn't have an apartment, <laughs> okay? So roofs or ceilings. Uh, and he published it uh, with the Foundation for Economic uh, Education. Uh, he also went after, early on, minimum wage legislation, arguing that that hurt the very people that it was trying to help. Uh, of course, most economists understand that now. Not too many did at the time uh, Friedman was writing. And uh, especially significant, he spearheaded the move to eliminate the military draft. This was in the late 60s and, and prevailed. Uh, and I only have one big complaint about that, and that is he didn't do it in quite enough time to save me from the military, okay? So I served my four years. <laughs> But uh, I applaud him for having uh, accomplished that. Now, that's neoclassical micro. Macro is a different story, especially as it involves uh, the business cycle. And you could guess, if, and you've heard my other lectures, that that's going to be one of my, uh, my focuses uh, in this lecture. Um, let me start here. I'm going to start with just the, the issue of levels of aggregation. Uh, all macroeconomists aggregate to one extent or another. Uh, and it turns out, here's a, a statement that's a bit of an overstatement, but just barely an overstatement. And that is that your aggregation scheme is your theory. Well, not quite, but almost. And uh, this was this is something I got from Axel Leyenhoofit. And what he meant was that as soon as you spell out the aggregates with which you're going to build your theory, you are already at that point suggesting that nothing going on within the aggregates has any claim on our attention, while relationships among the aggregates is going to tell us all we need to know. Okay? Well, that's almost wrong in all cases, or at least in many cases. And if you choose uh, an aggregation scheme that won't quite get the job done, then you're cooked from the beginning. Okay? So pay attention to aggregation. It's especially true in textbooks. The first chapter or two is like a you know, throat-clearing paragraphs that tell you what the aggregates are. And so you buy that 
hook, line, and sinker before you go into the next chapter, and you never recover because you don't understand why things are turning out so perverse. Well, it's because you chose the wrong level of aggregation. Now, I'm going to look at the several... See, this is by, about Hayek and Friedman, and yet Keynes always intrudes, uh, as he does in this particular case, too. But look what Keynes says. Actually, this is a, uh, simply my own summary of what he does. Theorizing at a high level of aggregation, C plus I plus G. John Maynard Keynes believed that market economies perform perversely, especially the market mechanisms that bring saving and investment into balance with one another. Seeing unemployment and resource idleness as the norm, Keynes called for counter-cyclical fiscal and monetary policies, and ultimately for a comprehensive socialization of investment. That last phrase in quotation marks is directly from the general theory, from his uh, chapter 24, that's the last chapter in the general theory, and uh, Keynes's uh, supporters argued that, oh, Maynard was just flying his kite. No, he didn't really mean that. He meant something else. I don't think so. I think he meant a comprehensive socialization of investment. Well, that's Keynes, okay? Look at Friedman. Friedman, Milton Friedman's monetarism was based on a still higher level of aggregation. He's going the wrong way, okay? The equation of exchange, that's MV equal PQ, money times the velocity of money, that's the frequency with which it turns over, is equal to the overall price level <coughs> times the output of the economy, quantity output. So MV equal PQ made use of an all-inclusive output variable, Q. In other words, Q is the output of consumption goods and the output of investment goods. So he just put those things together, called it Q, and so you don't worry about how much of it is C and how much of it is I, investment. That puts into eclipse the issue of the allocation of resources between current consumption and investment for the future, let alone the, the eclipse of stages of production that are differentially <coughs> sensitive to interest rate changes. And yet, He's a, he's a microman. He knows microeconomics, and he thinks markets work. He knows market work. So seeing no problem emerging from the market itself, Friedman focused on the relationship between the government-controlled money supply and the overall price level. That, that's really his whole research agenda, to see about movements in prices and the money supply, what causes what and so on, and looking at different countries and he sort of rehabilitated the old quantity theory of money. He didn't invent the quantity theory of money. It was part of the old classical system. But it had gone out of disfavor, especially with Keynes. And uh, Friedman brought it back. Well, okay, three cheers for, well, maybe two cheers for him uh, for doing uh, that. Okay. Now, Hayek, I can summarize and you can see that is what I've been talking about. Capital-based macroeconomics is distinguished by its propitious, I like that word, disaggregation, which brings into view both the problem of intertemporal resource allocation and the potential for a market solution. Hayek shows that a coordination of saving and investment decisions could be achieved by market government movements in the interest rate. He also recognized that this aspect of the market economy is especially vulnerable to the manipulation of interest rates by the central bank. So that sort of shows you the characters here. Uh, now, contrasting methods. First was Maynard Keynes, as exposited by Alan Meltzer, who wrote a book on Keynes. Meltzer is, is a monetarist himself, but he wrote on Keynes. And that was a good combination there, his writing on Keynes. And, but listen to what he says. And he's right. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm convinced of that. Keynes was the type of theorist who developed his theory after he had developed a sense of relative magnitudes and of the size and frequency of changes in these magnitudes. 
So he concentrated on those magnitudes that change most, often assuming that others remain fixed for the relevant period, okay? Now, when I read that, uh, the thing that came into my mind is what I've called a variation sieve. Does that look like a sieve? Yeah, it sort of does. It is a sieve. But hard to recognize it in a lecture like this, you know, is that a sieve? Yeah. And so, I mean, <laughs> try to imagine. You, you gather up a bunch of variables, uh, and some of them vary a lot, and some of them don't vary so much. Well, you just pour them through the sieve. And this, I mean, it's a special sieve. So you pour them through the sieve and all the ones that don't vary just fall through the sieve on the ground, okay? And the, and the ones left in the sieve are the only ones that Keynes wants to look at. That's how he's gonna construct his theory. Those are the building blocks for his theory. Right. Now, that's, that was Keynes's method. And, and this, here you'll see why I put Keynes in this, in the picture. Because Friedman says, I believe that Keynes theory is the right kind of theory in his simplicity. Its simplicity is concentration on a few key variable magnitudes and his potential fruitfulness. So he, he endorses Keynes theory. The implication here is that big effects have big causes. If you, you know, you have a, a depression, that's a big effect. Well, there must have been an awfully big cause, all right? Uh, and and Friedman actually says that in his monetary history, that uh, big causes have big effects, says that in essence. And yet it's not true. Now it's true in some cases, in some cases, um, Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii come to mind. You got a big cause and big effect, okay? But a, a thrown away cigarette butt in a forest fire is a little cause and a big effect, okay? So small causes can have big effects. Hard to detect causes can have big effects. And those are the things that may well have fallen through the sieve that's used by both Keynes and Friedman, we'll see. Now, Friedman, about the same time that he was talking about the methodology, uh, he wrote in the New York, it wasn't New York Times, what was it? Let me get down here, Time Magazine. He wrote, we're all Keynesians now. And people jumped on him thinking, oh, he's gone to the other side. Uh, but he, he insisted, no, no, he'd been taken out of context. And so he explained the context. And the context says we all use the Keynesian language and apparatus. All right, we use C plus I plus G. We, we uh, throw in some MV equal PQ too. But uh, generally we use the Keynesian macroeconomic framework. Well, <clears throat> that all is just too big an all. It doesn't include the Austrians, okay? Hayek is not a Keynesian now, wasn't a Keynesian then. And, didn't use the Keynesian language and apparatus. And so by that, we sort of, com we, we pair Keynes and Friedman against Hayek as far as your methodology goes. And, and so look what Hayek says in, in, rather than saying we need a, va a variation sieve, he says the role of the economist, he says this in the Pure Theory of Capital, is precisely to identify the features of the market process that are apt to be hidden from the untrained eye, all right? And in fact, what it turns out that what, what they need to pay attention to is some of those things that fell through the sieve, and particularly the rate of interest. For Hayek, then, the cause and effect relationship between central bank policy during the boom and the subsequent economic downturn have a first order claim on our attention, despite the more salient code movements in macroeconomic magnitudes that characterize the post-crisis spiraling down of the economy into deep depression. And what you'll find is that any macroeconomist is basically an econometrician, statistician. Uh, when they look at the Great Depression, 
they look at things that they can correlate and get some pretty good correlation <laughs> parameters on, all right? And those things are, are found during the period where the economy is crashing into depression. Lots of things are going down. <laughs> and so you can calculate the extent to which they go down at about the same rate. If you look at the boom, you don't necessarily see anything that you want to correlate. And I'll more about this later. Now, again, we'll go back to Hayek. He says, there may well exist better scientific evidence. He put scientific in quotes, as if doing econometrics makes it scientific. That is empirically demonstrated regularities among key macroeconomic magnitudes for a false theory, which will be accepted because it is more, quote, scientific. You've got the, you've got the co correlation coefficients. Then for a valid explanation which is rejected because there's no significant quantitative evidence for it. He might have overstated that. There's, there's not much and there's only weak quantitative evidence for it. So now, how methods shape substance. And here I'm trying to deal with the issue of identifying the cause. Think about this, the cause. I put it in quotes because Friedman puts it in quotes. Keynes attributes the downturn to psychological factors affecting the investment community rather than to monetary and physical disturbances. Okay? And, and this is, uh, do I say this? I suggest that a more typical and often prominent explanation of the crisis is a sudden collapse in the marginal efficiency of capital. That's direct, directly from Keynes. So, in other words, that's where he starts. He starts his business cycle theory with the fact that, you know, sometimes people just get cold feet and, and it tends to be contagious and they do it all at once and they just cut back and the economy starts down. Okay, now we can start our business cycle theory and find out what goes on after that and how to fix it, okay? So Keynes' main focus then uh, is the dynamics of the subsequent downturn, downward spiral uh, and on the policies aimed at reversing the spiral's direction. So he said, okay, we got everything going down now. We want to do something to get it turned around and going back up. And of course, what, what's that? Goosing up the economy, putting in more money, uh, lots of fiscal policy, lots of government projects, and so on, try to pump up the economy. Uh, just on the basis that uh, these, uh, of this collapse in the, in the investment in the first place. So it just, it just collapses. There's one passage I read years ago, and I, I can't find it again, so I'll ask you if you find it, send me an email, tell me where it is. <laughs> but Keynes had gone into a, a seafood restaurant, was waiting in the lobby, and there was an aquarium there with fish swimming from one end towards, towards the other in, in the aquarium. So it wasn't invented by Red Lobster. They did that back then too, you know, had the aquarium for everybody. And Keynes noticed that when the fish got no more than halfway or so to the other, towards the other end of the tank, they all of a sudden and all at once turned around and started going the other way. He noticed that. And, and he, he remarked to his dining companions, that's just like investors. They all turn around at the same time. They all get pessimistic at the same time. Okay? And nobody knows why these fish just all of a sudden turn around and go the other way. They're not even to the other side. Uh, a student in my class when I talked about that here at Auburn. She raised her hand and said, Dr. Garrison, they see their image in the reflection of the other side. <laughs> well, she knew more about fish than I did. I mean, what can I say? So Friedman, now get this, Friedman is dismissive of the whole issue of the cause of the initial downturn. I put, should have put cause in quotation marks here. 
1929, referring to it as, now he doesn't do this all at once, I, just, I can just find it throughout his uh, works, he calls it an ordinary run-of-the-mill routine garden variety recession. Okay, we started, that's what we started with. And what do those words mean? What do those things mean? That means that downturn, that's, that's just part of the market. It has no particular claim on our attention. You know, and it's only when things really get bad that we've got something to deal with. We've got something to explain. Actually, we've got something to correlate. I mean, that's what it's about. So his focus is on the policy blunders that occurred on the heels of the downturn and on the correlation between the decrease in the money supply and the decrease in real GDP. And he has those correlations in all of his uh, texts. That's, that's what it's all about. So for Friedman, the correlation between movements in money supply and movements in the total output leaves no doubt about the central issue. That, that's, what, that's what business cycle theory is all about. That's the central issue. Now here's Hayek. Friedrich Hayek focuses on the policy infected aspects of the boom and their implication for the boom's sustainability. The post-bus reallocation of labor and capital takes time, but the particular dimensions of the Great Depression, its length and depth, are to be explained largely in terms of the policy perversities that hampered the recovery. And especially in the Great Depression, I mean, when the Great Depression started, you had first Herbert Hoover, who play, paid lip service to market system, but did lots of things that uh, hurt the market. Uh, and Roosevelt uh, just did that in spades. I mean, he, he came in, he had all sorts of wage controls, price fixing, um, retained profits, tax, and all sorts of regulations that themselves, independent of, of an initial downturn, would put the economy into depression and keep it there for a long time. So how methods shape, shape substance, this is a summary. For Friedman, the full analysis of a business cycle consists almost wholly of an empirical accounting of the depression's depth and length. For Hayek, the ABCT, Austrian business cycle theory is fundamentally a theory of the unsustainable boom and the subsequent reallocations of misallocated resources. According, according to the actual depth and length of the depression that ensues uh, requires an economic and historical account of each particular period. In other words, what did Roosevelt do uh, thinking he was going to help get the economy back. And of course, he was doing all sorts of perverse things. And that's what has to be understood. Now, here's something that I came on to not too long ago. A paper by Eichen Green, uh, Barry, that'd be Barry Eichen Green and Michener. I can't think of Michener's name. There it is, Chris Michener, 2003. And look at the title. I don't know if you can read the title in that uh, small print. The Great Depression as a Credit Boom Gone Wrong. And that sounds like a Hayekian paper, doesn't it? And it was, a very Austrian paper. Uh, it was done uh, under the uh, direction of the BIS, that's uh, Bureau of International Settlements, working paper number 137. You can find it on the web. Bank for International Settlements. Now, Friedman was asked to rate that paper. What do you think about that paper? And look what he says. He says, Eichen Green's paper is excellent, clear, well-written, thoughtful. There's little in it that I disagree with. At the same time, I share the views expressed by my discussants or by his discussants, uh, Michael Bordeaux and Charles Goodhart, that it does not contribute much to the key issue of the question. He says, the issue is whether the depths 
and the seriousness of the depression is attributable to what took place in the 1920s or to what took place during the 30s. He goes on, does he go on? Yeah. The only item that has any bearing on that is the correlation of his measures of the credit boom with the depth of the subsequent depression. Here he gets a positive correlation of 0 0.43. Now, shame on Eichengrain to even present that number. <laughs> you don't want to present that number and say, hey, correlation is 0 0.43. That was it, you know, that was the cause. <laughs> No, that's a pitiful, that's a pitiful number there. Okay, it's positive correlation, 0.43 for the height that measures the stock market. Okay, that's pretty low, as Friedman says. The bulk of his evidence is that what happened in the 30s explained the 30s, not what happened in the 20s. That's actually private correspondence to Mark Skousen uh, in 2004. But... Uh, you get it. I mean, that's what he's saying. It, it doesn't matter. You got to get the correlations, and they find the correlations in the 30s, not in the 20s. I think my point is made, but I, I've used this before, so I'm going to use it again just to give you something to remember so you'll know it's been. Okay. The case of the cabbage eating Mississippi monster. You probably haven't heard about this, have you? Austrian and Chicago methodology in action. All right, now how does this work? Suppose that in late October 1929, a thousand pound monster descended on Mississippi soil. It spent the next three and a half years eating all the cabbages and quite a few rabbits between Tupelo and Pascagoula. By early March of 1933, the monster weighed 4,000 pounds. Yeah. okay. Two investigators are sent to Mississippi to get a handle on the situation. One is from Vienna, the other is from Chicago. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's there's the Mississippi monster. Can you see him down there? You I just Google Mississippi monster, and that's what I got. So I'll, I'll take it. The Viennese investigator asked, "Where in the world did this hideous thing come from?" It turns out on further investigation that the monster was the unintended consequences of some ill-conceived government-sponsored bionics project. Case closed. He went back home. Okay. Uh, the Chicagoan shows up, shoves the Austrian aside, okay, and says, never mind how this thing got here. The key question is how did it grow from 1,000 pounds to 4,000 pounds how did it, an ordinary, run-of-the-mill, garden-variety monster, quadruple its weight in 40 months? Okay? The Chicagoan's answer, of course, was that it was all those cabbages. He couldn't get good data on the rabbits. <laughs> the correlation between cabbage consumption and weight gain of the Mississippi monster leaves no doubt as to the central issue. Okay? So they're doing the same thing with business cycle. Query, do we expect that data availability is what led the Chicago to his conclusion? And that lack of hard data pertaining to the monster's origin caused him to be dismissive of questions about where the thing came from. These and related suspicions are what underlie the message in Hayek's Nobel, Nobel address, the pretense of knowledge, okay? How are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Now, look at Friedman's monetarism with the uh, equation of exchange. And there it is, MV equal PQ, M is money supply, V, frequency of turnover of money, velocity of money is called P, the overall price level, and Q is the output of the economy. With a nearly constant velocity of money, and that's in normal times, it can get out of, sh out of shape in un in the unnormal times, uh, you have output Q growing slowly, a couple three percent. Movements in the price level largely reflects movements in the money supply. So I put a, a bar over V means not changing to any significant degree. 
real Q, real output is growing slowly. Okay. And under those circumstances, any increase in the money supply shows up as an increase in the price level. And Freeman argues that the cause and effect goes from M to P. I think it does, but, but uh, he's, here's where he's using the word cause. And actually he uses it, uses cause freely in popular writings and he even says this. But in, in uh, academic writings, he uses some different word. Not sure what it is. And with a long and variable lag. It says with a long or with a lag here of 18 to 30 months. That is variable, 18 to 30 months. Uh, and, and that issue, why does it take 18 to 30 months? That's what, year and a half to two and a half years? Why would it take that long for an increase in the money supply to show up as an increase in prices? And, and Freeman says, well, that's, that's one of the unresolved issues of monetarism. Uh, didn't quite get the answer to that one. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, that was his claim. And here what I've done, If uh, how many of you heard my first lecture on capital theory? Did you? Most, most of you. Uh, and I'm not going to read this because it makes your head swim. You couldn't, uh, but I have shown my Knighty in uh, capital theory diagram. And, and you can see that Friedman uh, talks about how this business cycle goes on uh, by, by using, or this monetary injection goes on by using sources and services instead of some capital structure and a consumable output. And he even, even comes to the conclusion. The final result may be a rise in expenditures in all directions without any change in the interest rate at all. The interest rate and asset prices may simply be the conduit through which the effect of the money, of the monetary change is transmitted to expenditures without being altered at all. In other words, he's got a, a model there that has no time dimension in it. And so he, he figures out what the interest rate does. It goes this way and then that way and then back the other way. And when it settles down, it's right where it started, so there's no effect, okay? Well, the reason there's no effect is because there's no time for an effect. But if you have a capital structure, structure of production and so on, there is time for an effect. And during that time, we have, guess what? A depression. <laughs> and Friedman, Friedman missed that. Friedman's monetary rule here, that's increase the money supply at a slow and steady rate to achieve a long-run price level constancy. In other words, if uh, Q is going up, we'll make money go up at the same rate, say, uh, right. enough to keep prices from rising, enough to accommodate that increase in Q and keep P from rising, let M rise instead. All right, and now lately, won't blame this on Friedman, but the last couple or three Federal Reserve chairmen have adopted the notion that we need about a 2% inflation. And that's not a 2% increase in money supply, that's enough money to actually cause the price level to go up by 2%. So you not only increase the money supply by what's already shown, but you increase it a little more so that the price level uh, actually goes up. But what happens within the quantity aggregate as a result of the monetary injection. And of course, we see that by using our capital-based macroeconomics, that uh, the money is, is lent into existence and that depresses interest rates, all right? Uh, and, and so the interest rates goes down, it no longer signals what it's supposed to signal and that can give rise to a cyclical upturn and then a bust and a downturn. One thing that uh, Bernanke said, this was just before he turned or became chairman of the Fed. He was asked the question, this is an interview at the Minneapolis Fed. He was asked the question of uh, why, why would you want this 2% inflation going on? Oh, we want the 2% inflation going on. So 
that if, if the economy starts to falter into depression, we'll have the maneuvering power to, to fix it, okay? He never considered that the 2% inflation may actually lead <laughs> to a downturn. Well, he hasn't read Hayek, that's all I can, that's all I can say. So Friedman declares the 1920s the golden age years of the Federal Reserve. That's one of his chapter titles in his monetary history. It's the golden, golden years of the Federal Reserve. He ignores interest rates during the 1920s because they didn't change much. There was one instance when Friedman and I were having a back and forth based on an article he wrote in, in a comment that I published uh, about his article. And uh, he, he sent me a graph. Uh, that showed interest rates during the 20s. He said, see, they didn't much change during the 20s. There's nothing much you can say about that. But what if they should have changed, but weren't allowed to? Monetary, uh, in, uh, increasing the money supply to keep it from it. During the 1920s, breakthroughs in technology increased the demand for loanable funds and put upward pressure on interest rates. But the Federal Reserve, guided by the real bills doctrine, that means if there's more real stuff to buy out there, we'll put out more money to buy it, met each increase in the demand for credit with an increase in supply, thus keeping the interest rate from rising. So during the 20s, that, that's a time where you had uh, lots of productivity. And, and so it turns out that if you pump in money to keep the interest rate from rising, that simply adds an uh, unsustainable element to that uh, boom. So I like to say it rides piggyback on the uh, technological breakthroughs. Seeing no change in the interest rate, Friedman dismisses interest rates as a potential independent variable in his econometric equations. Uh, in other words, it went through the sieve. So the heck with it. Seeing no change in the interest rate when they should have seen, when they, sh when they should have risen because of the technological breakthrough. Hayek was able to identify some critical market forces hidden from the untrained eye. So that, that's what Hayek had in mind. That, those are the critical market forces hidden from the untrained eye. You can't imagine some uh, non economist or, or even some entrepreneur or some capitalist. Uh, who supposedly has, quote, rational expectations. You know all about that theory. Can you imagine them saying, oh, look, 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 the interest rate hasn't changed. I think it should have changed. <laughs> the Fed kept it from changing. No, that's, that's not going to happen. Query, which view, Friedman's or Hayek's, is more firmly anchored in the empirical, that is, historical circumstances in the 1920s? Well, I think that... Austrian view is anchored. Empirical doesn't mean uh, crunching numbers. It doesn't mean gathering data. It means understanding the real world and what's going on. Oh, there's Friedman uh, in his Cadillac, uh, MV equal PY. And there's a story about, well, there's two stories about that. One, I can tell it just with this uh, picture. Uh, that should be either M V equals P Q, because really P times Q is equal to Y. If you, and if you write just if you write P Y, you've got P squared Y, or P squared Q. Uh, so that's wrong. But uh, <laughs> and I, he, he knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong. But but uh, in monetarism, for some reason or other, they use capital letters for nominal terms, nominal income is capital Y, and they use lowercase for real income, little y. How many knew that? Oh, okay, so I'm not telling you any fib or anything, okay. And so he needed P little case Y. Now I can just see Friedman at the DMV arguing that, no, I need a lowercase Y. <laughs> and the amazing thing about it, if, 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 you knew Friedman or could know Friedman like I knew the guy. Didn't know him that well, but I knew him well enough, okay? 
I'm surprised he didn't prevail. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this over because we're getting close. And I want to show you one other thing. Maybe I don't. Let's see. Yeah. You recognize him, Greg Mankiw? Yeah. What, what was his, I probably say up there, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. And on one of the quiz shows Sunday morning, uh, he asked the burning question, how can you identify my car? And there it is, EC10. That's not, so, that's not such a great thing, but there it is. Um, so I know I hate to spoil things, but I must say I think Milton Friedman has a better plate, okay? Uh, years ago, blah, blah, and he says his, his plate read M equal PT. Now, T means transactions. That's the old Knightian view. So that wasn't right either. And here it says Milton Friedman's license plate was PV, MV equal PQ, not MV equal PT. And they claim to have, a, have it on the web. Well, of course, we've seen the Dyson plate. It was PY, all right? Now, it turns out that uh, when I was in California at uh, close to Stanford University, and Friedman was at the Hoover Tower, and he parked his car in the lot there. I walked over there, I could actually walk from where I was to, to that place, uh, to take a picture of Friedman's license plate. Uh, and I looked and looked and looked, and I, I didn't find it. I came back another, another day, <laughs> and I still didn't find it. But that that link that was given, that what I did find was a Cadillac. I knew he drove a Cadillac, but it was red with a white top. I thought, would Friedman buy a Cadillac red with a white top? Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't have that license plate. I, I was desperate. I took a picture of it anyhow. And then when I got back to school or back to the Institute for Humane Studies, I fiddled with the license plate some. So this person says, this, this was in French. So, hey, there's France there. Uh, this is on the web. And there it is, MV equal PQ. In other words, they've stolen my picture of the Cadillac <laughs> and did it that way. Okay. Well, good enough. We're at an ending point now. Thank you. <laughs>